Well, immediately following Jesus' statement that this generation will not pass away until all things take place, he made the following statement. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now, futurists take the position that Jesus was speaking of the end of the world as we know it at some point yet in our future. But that just doesn't hold up under scriptures. Those words of Jesus, that heaven and earth would pass away, always bothered me. Why would heaven pass away? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that the meek would inherit the earth. Why would he promise an inheritance to the meek that was going to be eventually destroyed? That one's always bothered me as well. So what could Jesus possibly have meant by heaven and earth will pass away but my word will never pass away. Remember, the statement comes in the very middle of his prophetic declaration of the coming destruction of Jerusalem and the temple that was going to take place in 70 AD. And it wasn't until I heard that Josephus, in his first century history of the antiquities of the Jews and the wars of the Jews, stated this. He stated that the Jews referred to the temple and the temple complex as heaven and earth. Well, with that understanding and the placement of Jesus' comments in the Olivet Discourse, it now makes sense. Jesus was stating in language that the first century Jews would understand that their temple, heaven and earth, was going to pass away, but his word would stand forever. In other words, they could take his promise of the impending destruction of Jerusalem and the temple to the bank. It was going to happen, and it did. As we saw yesterday, this portion of the Olivet Discourse begins with the words that in, are found in Luke 21, verse 25. There will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations. In perplexity, at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they'll see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, throughout the Old Testament, the sun, moon, and stars are used to speak of authorities. And before you reject this statement outright and say, well, you're just, you're just reading your opinions into the text, let's look at the very first occurrence of such an interpretation. We go all the way back to Genesis chapter 37 and the story of Joseph and his brothers. We pick it up in Genesis 37 verse 5. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, Please listen to this dream which I've had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect, and behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams, and for his words. Now he had still another dream, and he related it to his brothers, and he said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And he related it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now here's a question for you. How did Jacob know that Joseph's dream, the sun, the moon, and the stars bowing down to him represented himself, Joseph's mother, and his brothers. It was understood. The sun, moon, and stars 
represented authority. And in this case, it was family authority. In other places throughout the Old Testament, it represented governing authorities. And in other places, it represented religious authorities. So when Jesus speaks of the sun, moon, and stars, right in the middle of his prophetic declaration of the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, and the removal of the kingdom from the apostate Jewish leaders and their followers, it is consistent with Old Testament apocalyptic language. In numerous places in the writings of the prophets, the sun, moon, and stars were used to describe God's judgment and the destruction of nations, authorities, and powers. And Jesus uses the exact same language to describe what is about to come on Jerusalem. Now back to verse 26 in Luke 21, and Jesus speaks of men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, I believe Hebrews was written to believing first century Jews who had embraced Jesus as the Messiah. The entire book is contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant that was inaugurated by Jesus, the kingdom. The old covenant was inaugurated at Mount Sinai, and Mount Sinai is presented throughout the scriptures, both Old and New Testaments, in contrast with Mount Zion, or the heavenly Jerusalem. Now this is very similar language to what we find in Hebrews chapter 12 when the writer introduces us to his words, the unshakable kingdom. He tells his readers that they have not come to Mount Sinai, but they have come to Mount Zion. Let's read it. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Now you got to ask yourself a question. What in the world is the blood of Abel doing right here? It's because it's directly tied to the destruction of Jerusalem, as Jesus said earlier in the Gospels. See to it, verse 25, that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he is promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. And this expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable sacrifice with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. The kingdom, the messianic kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the new covenant, the heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion. These are all terms that are synonymous for this new covenant that comes through the presence of Messiah. The shaking of the heavens is the removal of the old covenant, the temple, the Judaistic system. And we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, a kingdom that will remain forever. But the earthly kingdom of first century Judaism, the earthly Jerusalem, the earthly temple was being removed and was destroyed by fire. Our God is a consuming fire. And to make this speak of something in our future, 
is to deny the reality and to deny the significance of the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy that the temple was going to be destroyed and not one stone would be left upon another. That the tares, the apostate, wicked leadership of the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, and their followers were going to be taken out from among the righteous and burned with fire. Now, I know that's a lot to chew on. Study the word. Let scripture interpret scripture. Folks, this is good news. We are a part of an unshakable kingdom, a kingdom that knows no end. And all people everywhere are invited into intimate fellowship with God and all have the opportunity through faith and repentance to know him intimately unhindered access to the Father. The tabernacle, the dwelling place of God, is now among men, and he is our God, and we are his people. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today, and I I hope you'll be with me again right here tomorrow morning as we continue our study of the parables of Jesus, and we look further into what Jesus had to say about his kingdom and this Olivet Discourse. Remember, he calls us to walk in love with all people everywhere. Be a channel of his love and grace to everyone you come in contact with today. Look for the opportunities that he presents you with to lead someone to faith in Jesus, the promised Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the whole world. Now, why not click on the subscribe button on the lower right corner of your screen and you'll be notified in YouTube whenever a new video gets posted. And if you're watching on Facebook, consider sharing this on your wall and invite your friends to watch it. Hey, I hope you'll go out and make today a great day.